Schnäpsle. My name is uh, Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government. I work for the regulator for the electronic media and telecommunication, which is Ofcom. And actually, this, um, this uh, workshop was uh, co-organized by um, the Council of Europe and the EBU and others. And uh, Lee Hibbard, who was the main uh, driver behind the workshop, he unfortunately uh, could not come here because the Council of Ver uh, Europe decided on Friday uh, that uh, it was, uh, they could not guarantee the safety of their uh, people and they did not send their people uh, here. And so I'm taking over uh, for him and uh, try to help uh, uh, making this workshop uh, uh, happen and uh, <coughs> making it an interesting uh, event. Um, to start with, we have a, um, a video message sent by uh, Ms. Maud de Boer, the Deputy Secretary uh, General of the Council of Europe, who uh, will say a few words uh, to you on this workshop, if I could ask you to, to play the message. Thank you. <clears throat> really sorry that I'm not able to be with you in person, physically present in Hyderabad. However, it is not in any way linked to the commitment of the Council of Europe to the IPF process. I feel that my main message is the 2007 IPF in Rio de Janeiro concerning the public value and the importance of the internet is even more important today. As time passes, what we want, what we need, is to ensure that we can all access and benefit from the internet, and in particular to work, to communicate, to seek and impart information and ideas, to acquire knowledge, and to do business. We believe that the internet is a critical resource for all, which means accessibility for people with disabilities, communities, people in a situation of vulnerability, or who are otherwise disadvantaged, and social groups, including minority groups, as well as the elderly. <coughs> in this connection, we have to consider the internet as both a service in its own right, and as a means to reach other services. We must encourage the use of the internet as a platform for dialogue, to encourage tolerance, mutual understanding, and social cohesion. This is one of the Council of Europe's main objectives, to reach full participation of all citizens and other stakeholders, <coughs> in particular through the transparency of governments and in accessing information. In all of this, the role of the state and of the private sector, in particular through public-private partnerships, is central to facilitating the Internet's public value in the development and delivery of Internet services. Services which are <coughs> accessible, affordable, secure, reliable, and ongoing. In mapping out what you think the public value of the Internet means for you today, in developing strategies for better access to internet and in providing quality content bearing in mind media and information literacy, I ask you to make use of Council of Europe work already developed and agreed upon by our 47 member states. Our recommendation on measures to promote the public service value of the internet is a roadmap for discussion on public value and human rights, public value and democracy, public value and access, openness, security, and diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you an excellent workshop. Thank you to UNDESA and to Ofcom Switzerland for having agreed to organize and moderate the workshop in our absence. Thank you very much. Um, now we have um, five speakers who will um, go uh, into detail about the, uh, uh, make some presentations about the issue of the workshop. If I could ask you to display the three key questions that we have. Uh, those are the three questions that uh, 
will guide uh, the, the discussion of the workshop. The first one is, and it's also something we want to hear from you in, uh, after half an hour that these presentations will take, what is the, <laughs> <laughs> what is the public value of the internet? Or the, what are elements that create a public value, a value for the public of the internet? <clears throat> Uh, that improve the quality of our lives. So the second question is, which services are related to those elements? Which services create and express these values? The third question is, how can the users and the citizens have access to these uh, uh, services and make best use and most efficient use of these services? Because it's no, no use having services that people cannot use because they don't have access. <clears throat> and uh, point number four is, Maybe we, we can uh, come up or you can come up with some uh, good practices or, or bad examples of elements uh, that create a public value uh, on the internet. Um, now I would like to uh, uh, introduce to you the, the speakers that we have. We have Haiyan uh, Kian from uh, UNDESA. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> as number second, we have uh, Mr. Frederick Riel from Ofcom, the Swiss regulator. We have uh, Giacomo Mazzone from EBU, the European Broadcasters Union. We have uh, Haya Sheriff from Microsoft uh, in India. And we have Jagdish Lata from Tata Consultancy Services also in India. So I would like uh, Ayan to uh, come here and uh, make the presentation. Do we need microphones for those who, who speak? OK, thank you. <clears throat> Only me sitting there. I think it's enough people now. That Thank you very much. Maybe uh, all the speakers can come up uh, now and, and sit on, on, on the podium. <laughs> if, this is, uh, if this is easier. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be the first to uh, uh, actually address uh, these uh, questions that Thomas uh, raised to all of us. And I hope that uh, this is a very interactive workshop and we have to learn from each other. So I'm not going to give you a long speech. Uh, basically, I would like to share with you uh, some of the work that we do, which I think will also answer some of the questions, I hope, uh, that raised uh, by our chair. Um, I think that one of the uh, popular value that the internet actually has provided and will continue to provide is to uh, make the uh, public service um, better and uh, the, uh, um, which will be more efficient and effective uh, to our citizens um, and also to make our government operations more transparent and accountable and also more participatory. Um, I just want to share with you the, the, some of the uh, uh, highlights that I would like to uh, emphasize here uh, in terms of the, uh, 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 the uh, values that uh, this, this such a service can uh, provide if um, the, uh, um, the internet will be very well used and designed. Uh, so it's really not only uh, the technology which, which will, uh, or internet, which will uh, promote this better service, uh, public service to our citizens, but I think it, 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 technology maybe is 20% of the success and 80% and, and of the governance issue which we have to address. I think this is something that I would like to highlight. Um, based on the following uh, four points, um, I, I believe that that can become a uh, enabler or, or a successful enabler or be, can become a barrier uh, to the success of such initiatives that we call it uh, e-government or e-governance. And the first I would say uh, is the, uh, uh, this kind of uh, e-government initiatives that government so far have initiated uh, uh, based on our uh, five-year research. Uh, if you may know or you may not know that uh, UNDESA has uh, uh, been produced 
using a e-government uh, survey. Um, uh, worldwide, uh, basically uh, assessed the 192 member states of the United Nations on how government use internet to improve their uh, public service delivery. And based on our findings, and we, we believe that, that there are four uh, major issues that we really have to address. First is that the, the such e-government initiative has to be very uh, citizen-centric, uh, which means that when you plan uh, make a strategy of this kind of e-government initiatives and also in the implementation of this kind of uh, uh, plan you have to always keep in mind uh, who are your uh, clients and how to uh, meet the clients needs and what we found uh, uh, through the last uh, five years is that most of the government initiatives were not planned based on the, uh, the uh, assessment or needs assessment, as we say, uh, of the citizens. And what is the usage of, because the value has to be added. It's not something which you simply just move the, uh, uh, your service to internet, then which will be considered as a, uh, a you know, added public value. So what is the added value? You have to really think hard. And if you do not engage citizens and you do not know what citizens need, many often times this kind of initiative will fail. Uh, as uh, the, the survey uh, tells us that uh, uh, two years ago, it was almost like 80% of the government, uh, government uh, initiatives fail due to that reason. And I think the, uh, the, the percentage has de uh, been decreased. However, uh, this is still a, a, a question. And uh, second, uh, the point that I want to highlight is the, uh, the such initiative has to be very inclusive, meaning that, uh, as ma mentioned by the, uh, the, the Deputy Secretary General of uh, Council of Europe, that you really, the government have to pay attention <coughs> to this digital divide because the internet can provide opportunities but at the same time can provide barriers and can provide some uh, uh, challenges which we all have to uh, uh, pay attention to. So the, uh, the, this marginalized group <coughs> is the first uh, group that the government should pay attention. And this group uh, includes those who cannot afford, but those who also have a, a disability to access, and those who may have a barriers in language uh, of the, the contents that provided, and those who may have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, f uh, phobia of, of internet. And uh, this uh, sometimes addressed to the, uh, the aged people. And, and, but also uh, there's an issue of how to make your service uh, 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 more customized to different groups of the society. So that is also a very important issue. And uh, without this uh, uh, thinking of the, in, uh, making sure that the, this vulnerable group is addressed, the, the e-governance uh, 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 program cannot be successful. And the third point I would uh, highlight uh, will be include, uh, will, uh, will be related to uh, the issue of um, the uh, integration of the government services, so uh, which is related to the back end office, and it's very much related to the governance, e-governance issue, uh, which address the transformation of government in the information age. You cannot simply just uh, think that the technology. Once you have the technology in place and and you have your service online, which means that you will provide uh, uh, needed uh, uh, service that uh, you know citizens will appreciate. And many times we, f we found out that, uh, gov uh, in fact, that the, the, the portal or uh, the e-government um, uh, services that uh, government provided on the internet, uh, many of the times uh, citizens do not even uh, uh, know uh, what is, what is uh, provided. And not to mention whether these services are really uh, very useful to, to the citizens. So um, the, uh, there's a very much need to think how to uh, realign the, uh, the structure of the government into the new demand, uh, new challenges, because you, are, you used to provide conventional services, uh, which is very different uh, from uh, the service that you will provide from the internet. 
Therefore, there's a, a, a very much need to restructure your institution and reallocate your resources, financial and human, and retrain your public servants who will be able to address the new um, uh, the issues that which will be related to the service delivery. Um, the last thing I would also mention will be related to uh, the uh, partnership. And uh, we all know that uh, the, 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 the uh, e-government <coughs> relies on the uh, technology, uh, which is, cannot be really left alone to the government uh, to uh, address this. And uh, so there's a strong need for public and private partnership. And man, many of times, uh, is, is, uh, you, uh, government will depend on the advice from those who have pioneered in this initiative, and basically it's the private sector. And not only the, uh, uh, you, there's a need to cooperate in terms of mobilizing resources, but more important is to learn the uh, soft uh, uh, knowledge, uh, particularly in the management, um, how to use the technology to make a, a, a more sustainable service uh, a platform. So then you can ask them now if that's a, okay. Any questions? Ah, you have a microphone. Uh, so I want to give the floor to Mr. Frederick Riedl from uh, Switzerland. He will tell you about uh, a few things about how Swiss government sees uh, the public value of the internet and how it tries to create it or facilitate the creation. Okay. It's running? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. As uh, Thomas mentioned, I will say a couple of words about uh, universal service in Switzerland. Uh, of course, uh, every member of society has the right to participate in social, economic, and political life. And these principles are also available on in the virtual world as the internet. Okay. Well, <coughs> what's concerned uh, the uh, public value? I will say some word first. What's concerned the responsibility of government to facilitate the citizen access to internet? There are several responsibilities for government. First, to promote the universal service to access to telecom uh, to communication, including broadband. Second, uh, to promote equal access to people with disabilities. Third, to help the citizen to build confidence in the use of the internet. It could be by regulation or co-regulation. Third, fourth, sorry, to promote multilingualism and diversity in the internet. And uh, uh, for example, uh, is to promote access to, for everybody in his native language. Fifth, to, prom to protect the right of citizens. And it could be, for example, uh, help to protect the fundamental rights like freedom of expression, privacy. Six, to promote the e-inclusion and empowerment of people. For example, promote media literacy. And seven, take a lead role of offering e-services. Let's take the example for e-government. I will focus now for um, a couple of words what's concerned universal service. Uh, universal service in Switzerland uh, is still in force since uh, 2008. The universal service is to, the, the objective is to make available uh, basic telecommunication services to all sections of population in Switzerland and all country, all region of the countries. And it, this service must be affordable, reliable, and have a certain level of quality. It includes telephony, telefax, data transmission, and what is important for us now, it's broadband internet connection. Access to emergency service, public phone, 
and public payphone and the provision of special services for disabled people. Now we have uh, tried in Switzerland to promote the uh, fast internet connection with the universal service uh, uh, that was promoted in 2008. First, this fast connection must guarantee a minimum of level of quality. That means minimum transmission rate of 600 up, down and 100 kilobits up. This uh, granted universal service uh, license is free to choose the technology in every individual case, that means this universal service can be uh, can use UMTS, satellite, WiMAX, <coughs> or other technology. The maximum price is uh, 50, 50, 50, 50, 55 sorry dollars for broadband internet, voice choice, voice channel, and telephone number, and an entry in the public telephone directory. This price will be re-examined in uh, 2010 according to the, uh, uh, the market price in uh, the future. The citizen uh, who had possibility to have another, an alternative broadband access, uh, for example, through cable television company, this is, in this case, there is no obligation for the universal service operator to give another uh, uh, access. What's concerned uh, additional services for people with disabilities? There is two measures uh, what has been uh, uh, foreseen. First, the provision of an SMS relay services for the hearing impaired, and second, uh, an expansion of the directory and switching service for people with limited mobility. For example, people who cannot uh, deal telephone numbers because they are uh, of their disability. In practice, uh, the Swiss Federal, the Swiss uh, Federal Commission for Communication, granted the universal service to uh, license to Swisscom, which was the only candidate for it. Uh, it was foreseen to finance a universal service with the fees uh, paid by all the telecom operators present <coughs> of the market. And so to contribute a fund that uh, Swisscom could take the money for the service. But at this time, nobody has to uh, get paid money for this fund because Swisscom doesn't ask money for the universal service uh, on broadband. It seems that uh, uh, this is not a necessity for the operator to ask uh, subsidize for this uh, new service in broadband in Switzerland. The second point and last point that we would like to raise uh, is uh, the special uh, rule what's concerned accessibility standard for website to promote equal participation for people with disabilities and vulnerable group. In the Swiss constitution, it's uh, illegal to discriminate uh, against people we have, which have, which have, uh, who have a physical and mental uh, or mental disability. And on this basis, the government promote and parliament promote a federal act on the elimination of discrimination against people with disability. And uh, the, in cooperation with the uh, with NGO, the <coughs> Swiss Confederation present at the end of the year 2007 a national-wide accessibility standard for web websites and a manual to help uh, implementing the standards. This standard is based on the accessibility guidelines of the World Wide Web Consortium and puts the free disposal not only for the public administration but also as disposal for the private sector. And since 2007, all uh, federal public administration have to be free on barriers for to disabled people. Uh, it had a big success, and uh, it was uh, uh, there was a monitoring made by uh, uh, NGO in Switzerland, and it was quite a big success. Was concerned the federal administration. 
Unfortunately, in Switzerland, we have also we have a federal state, and uh, uh, we cannot say that uh, we have such so much excellence in now what concerns the canton and uh, the community in, in Switzerland. But we will try to uh, convince them to have this <coughs> uh, uh, to uh, apply this guideline. So that was two examples that I want to give you. That uh, uh, what concerns public value, it's necessary to have. Uh, an approach what comes in first to facilitate the, uh, the accessibility for all the people and all the population uh, concerning the technology because without this possibility of everybody to have a quite uh, affordable uh, good quality <coughs> to broadband uh, for using internet you <coughs> can not have uh, uh, services at all and public values at all so that's an example we do in uh, uh, Switzerland, and uh, perhaps uh, we hope that gives an idea for other uh, countries. Uh, there is a big discussion now in the EU, in the European Union, to think about what could be the possibility to have also such a universal service obligation as concerned broadband. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. So we ha first have heard uh, a, a presentation that was concentrating on the prerequisites uh, on how to make best use of the services. We have now heard uh, uh, two concrete examples on how a government tries to facilitate access to, to the internet, to the services for disabled people and also uh, universal service obligation for, of broadband uh, for the whole country, even the remotest areas. And uh, since uh, I will give the floor now to the uh, representative of the European Broadcasting Union, maybe we hear uh, something about the content or possible or an, an example of content of or, uh, that might create uh, a public value. Giacomo, please. <coughs> this means that there are within this uh, association um, very different kind of broadcasters uh, and um, I will quote mo mostly example coming from Europe because this is the place that I know the better but uh, most of the needs and the problems and the solutions are common to everybody. Um, among the duties of the public service broadcasters, one of the most important uh, is the social cohesion. Uh, in, um, in a society more and more complex and in societies where uh, multi-ethnic communities uh, find uh, side by side uh, living together, it, the social cohesion <coughs> becomes more and more complex and difficult. In this sense, uh, if, we, if there is a value that uh, we need to recreate on the internet uh, from the broadcasting point of view is to recreate the same community, that national community or large community that we are able to create in the broadcasting world. <laughs> um, this means that uh, we need to migrate into the uh, internet, and this is what many of our members are doing, migrate services for instance the, for minorities, for minority languages, the, where usually when we use these terms we mean the mi minorities, historical minorities, but also for the new minorities that are the community of the immigrants that uh, arrived in different uh, societies and uh, uh, have to integrate the, the, the country in which they now live. Uh, a second value that is uh, really important um, from the broadcasting point of view is the application of the universal service to the broadcasting. Um, it's strange that um, very often we forget when we talk of the internet world that the internet at the moment reach only a quarter of the um, families in the world while uh, there is a media like radio for instance that reach 95% of the households in the world, including the most remote rural areas. So if we want to work um, in order to um, uh, fight the digital divide and to have a, a, an open society in which everybody could participate, the, the transition needs to be done through the broadcasting experience and through the broadcasting media because uh, we know how to do it keeping together the communities to, that we serve. This is why uh, in, um, uh, recently uh, in Europe we, um, we have launched the, um, a, different, uh, a different label for Define Ourselves. We are not anymore talking of uh, 
uh, public service broadcasting, but we are talking of public service media. This means that uh, we are trying to apply the same principle all over the different platforms that are available in uh, the communities and in the societies. Uh, so the television, the radio, the enhanced media, the internet, uh, the mobile, etc., etc. Where we need the, to bring these contents available to everybody. Um, which kind of services, new services are available, are made available by the pro, uh, public, public service media? Um, uh, for instance, uh, one of the most uh, in, interesting examples is what happens uh, in, um, in the UK at the moment, where BBC make a big effort, for instance, in creating communities in the web world that are then translated and, uh, and linked to the communities in the broadcasting world. Because you, you have to remember that not only you have digital divide made by census, by uh, wealth, but also you have a digital divide made by age. There are people that uh, will never access to the com a computer or to the internet because of their age, because of their educational skills, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this effort means to create micro communities or large communities in the web but remember to this community constantly that they are part of larger community <coughs> that makes the national integration, that make the society in which they live. It's a very difficult effort, a very difficult enterprise, endeavor, but this is what the broadcasters are trying to do in, uh, in all countries. Um, a second effort, very important, is access to archive. As you know, the history of all countries uh, in the 20th century and nowadays is not anymore made by article of newspaper or books, but is made by images, sounds, pictures that make our memory. This living memory in the last 100 years is mainly in the television. And the effort is to bring back this memory available to the citizen through access. This was not possible in the past, but now it's possible through the internet. And there are some interesting experiments uh, that are mm, conducted in many countries in making access, making possible the access to the archives. And uh, uh, there is, for instance, the iPlayer at BBC at the moment that makes possible also to access in every moment from everywhere on any platform the contents that are usually available through the broadcasting. Uh, last example that I want to quote now, but then we can come back later in the debate. Uh, is the service for disabilities. Uh, as you know, um, in Europe, the new directive in the public service uh, media uh, ask to all broadcasters, especially to public service broadcasters, to make available service for disabled, making accessible the highest percentage possible of the contents for disabled. So the subtitling and other new technologies for uh, making possible the access also to uh, less able people. And this is a big effort on which we are working that needs a lot of work on the standardization process, on the tools on, from the, electronic, the consumer electronic side, but also a lot of work on the contents to make them adapt to the new environment. That's all. I, I will have more to say eventually during the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Giacomo, uh, who uh, has been uh, talking about what, in the view of the, uh, of the broadcasters, their contribution to a public value is, and uh, some, has mentioned some concrete services. Now I'd like to give the floor to Haya Sharif from Microsoft in India. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, Okay, I'm just, I'm just going to stand up, uh, otherwise I'm going to be hidden behind the screen. Um, so uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Haja, and uh, you know, till yesterday I, was, I had no plans of coming here. And uh, the, the other speaker who was supposed to come from Singapore could not make it. So, so uh, personally, I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for me to also get a perspective of what we are <coughs> doing from a public-private partnerships uh, from a Microsoft point of view and uh, hearing some of the other experts and their feedback and how it ties in with uh, the way we are approaching the uh, entire PPP engagement and, and how we're leveraging the, leveraging the internet. So from, from that perspective, I think uh, this is going to be uh, you know, a very useful session and a good learning uh, engagement for, for me as well. Uh, very quickly, 
you know, I'll, I'll keep the presentation very short. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, as you can notice, I'm the only guy making a presentation formally. So, what's Microsoft without a PowerPoint presentation? So, quick, uh, a quick uh, background. I'll talk about the introduction of what the uh, PTA program. We call it Partnership for Technology Access. Uh, instead of getting straight into the discussion of uh, you know how we engage, uh, my, my uh, thought was I'll take you through a real life example of where we uh, we used a, a public-private partnership uh, model and uh, some of the learnings from there, and you know that that will uh, relate back to some of the uh, inputs that uh, you're, you're hearing from the uh, rest of the uh, panelists, um, and and then we'll have the discussion subsequently. Um, the PTA mission, the Partnership for Technology Access mission from a Microsoft perspective is to make PCs more relevant and affordable through public-private partnerships. So, so the intent is obviously still to uh, you know, look at addressing the digital divide, work with the government, through the government, address the citizens out there and ensure that uh, you know, it's not just the, uh, the hardware that goes in but ensure that there's relevance and affordability that uh, you know, drives home to the uh, rest of the, the target audience that we're talking about. Uh, very quickly, in terms of uh, the, the Guatemala case, uh, Guatemala is a country in uh, Latin America, and uh, you know, um, just like most of the other countries, they have a very, very clear policy in terms of their ICT rollout. Education is critical, and uh, they are obviously looking at uh, you know uh, ensuring that all their uh, you know the children in, in Guatemala are uh, ICT literate, so they understand computers, they are able to leverage computers, and are able to access the internet and you know leverage the power of the internet so to speak and uh, one of the challenges that they faced or or the discussions they had was you know uh, while all the students are being are being given uh, computers are being uh, you know provided with the content they had an issue where the overall learning the the, the engagement was not uh, you know bearing fruit the way the government had envisaged it and uh, as part of the uh, discussions, when Microsoft started talking to the Ministry of Education, the, the uh, feedback and the learning we got from various surveys was that was not a lack of investment from the government. There was more than enough. There, it was not a lack of vision from the government. They had a very clear vision. They, they were very clear in terms of what they wanted to do. The issue was in terms of the execution. So they had content. They had uh, <coughs> engines by which the PCs were going down and uh, touching the schools and the students. but it was still not driving the kind of results that they wanted. And, and the, the, the reason that it turned out was the key stakeholder in terms of making this whole uh, transfer happen in terms of knowledge and in terms of the, uh, the ability to use a PC in terms of, uh, you know, from, from, the, uh, uh, from a, I, the government vision to a student perspective, the bottleneck was from a teacher perspective. So most of the teachers, the people who were expected to teach the students, were not ready, were not able to reach the level by which they could go and uh, you know, provide the right level of content and uh, train the students. And hence, we got into the discussion with the government of, uh, in terms of building a more uh, relevant PPP uh, engine. And uh, uh, one of the learnings that we had there was uh, you know, all the teachers across the country, and that was around 80,000 teachers who needed to uh, move to a central location in Guatemala City. Uh, every six months, and they needed to take a week off, and uh, you know, there's just the sheer uh, logistics involved, the sheer uh, you know issue in terms of moving these people, getting them away from the ground, was enough to cause major disruption across the board. So most teachers did not turn up, or even if they did, they were not really particularly you know engaged in terms of making the whole uh, model work, and and that led us to the next uh, stage in terms of figuring out how we could create a a public-private uh, partnership model working with the uh, teachers. And, and the, the discussion we had there was to move away from a scenario of uh, you know, just getting a teachers to the central location, but seeing how the teachers could be part and parcel of the overall end-to-end uh, -end model in terms of getting the, the students ready. So the, the public-private partnership engine and, and the, uh, the, the value proposition that we put forward was to see how we could get the teachers enabled and uh, by enabling, we also thought about how, how, what was the best way to uh, get them to uh, learn PCs was in terms of owning PCs. So the value proposition that we, uh, we went ahead with the uh, Ministry of Education, which they supported and ultimately built that uh, public-private partnership, was in terms of assisting the teachers uh, to own their own PCs, 
to ensure that they have it in their homes. That the logic being that uh, a teacher who uh, you know uses the PC at home uh, moves to a level where instead of teaching about computers to students, he uses a computer to teach. So it, it changes the paradigm in, uh, in, in many ways. And, and the impact was felt significantly across the board. So out of 80,000 teachers, 60,000 teachers went on to buy a PC. And uh, ultimately, you know, it's, it's impacting almost 2 million students across the board. And the way we built the whole value proposition, the content was in terms of you know, uh, uh, data points and, and trainings, which were all kept on the internet and uh, allowing access for the teachers to get there. So which leads me to my first uh, point in terms of you know, uh, what, what is our learning and uh, how do we really approach the government when we talk about a public-private partnership? It's to ensure that there's a very clear target audience. Instead of having a one-size-fits-all, our, our perspective is let's try and zero in on a set of uh, you know, a target audience or, or a segment uh, within the overall uh, team that uh, we're looking at to ensure that we, we identify the pain points, not just from a government perspective, but then also from the end user perspective. Build that relevance and you know, ensure that the target audience is clear. So it's not ICT as a whole for education, but then you have a student-centric perspective, you have a teacher-centric perspective. And, and we try to moderate that discussion with the government, and that, that has played a very, very significant uh, uh, part in terms of how we engage the government and moving away from a product discussion to a more win-win uh, kind of a discussion. So, so that, that's the first element. Uh, from a government perspective, relevance is also, you know, we, we don't go on a tangent, but to work with the government and uh, to see how we can work through the government addressing their the pain points. So, uh, I mean, education is one example. We, we are doing similar things from a tourism perspective, working with the Ministry of Tourism to see how we can help them double the uh, number of tourists coming into their particular state. And, and uh, you know, that's relevance to the government and talking their language. And uh, once you get into that kind of a discussion, the whole uh, uh, discussion that you have with them subsequently is, 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 is at a different level and not so product-centric, but outcome-centric. And also from a private partner perspective, I mean, this is, this is important, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and something which we tell the uh, government as well. There is an element of sustainability. You know, it, it's always good that uh, there are many instances where the government works with grants that comes from the United Nations and others. But uh, what is also noticed is once the grant goes, the overall project just goes down instantly. So it's for simple reason, because the sustainability element is not there. So the local ecosystem needs to be able to sustain even after the grants move away or, or, or the government focus moves, moves away. So that's, that's the other, elements, uh, other uh, element of uh, relevance I just wanted to highlight. Uh, from a Microsoft perspective, these are some of the areas we're looking at in terms of working with seniors. So there is a very big population that's coming up, which are uh, you know, retirees, and how do we really work with them? We're looking at public health, workforce competitiveness, entrepreneurship in terms of uh, you know, more and more small businesses coming up online to make them more competitive, which ensures that the, uh, the state is more competitive in terms of attracting more investments, which uh, in turn helps the overall ecosystem and the economy in general. New world of government, the example was teachers. The same logic applies to uh, government servants. You know, the government invests a lot of money in, uh, in, in uh, IT, but not all government servants actually use it. And it's, it's very prevalent, very common in the third world countries. And, uh, you know, how do we uh, counteract that is by uh, looking at the same example like teachers to, to uh, you know, work with the government and see how their employees can uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, use PCs, thereby improving their skill sets. And, and that, in turn, ensures that the return on investments in terms of what the government puts in is a lot, lot more quicker. The second element that uh, you know, we, we believe is critical is in terms of affordability. Now, affordability, the way we look at it, is uh, you know, also in terms of the consortium. Uh, an overall solution, even if it's an education uh, uh, point of view, is not just PCs going in. There is content. So there are ISVs. There are solution vendors, there are content uh, providers who build that content. We're talking about hardware, so there is a company that gets involved. There is the uh, element of uh, you know, financing, so who will support in terms of ensuring that the affordability ele element uh, gets built into the uh, overall offering for this target audience. And, and, and that becomes something which we, we believe is uh, something that you know, we, we want the, uh, uh, the government to uh, look at. And these are discussions we have up front. So it's not so much to say that you know you, Mr. Government, support us. We will go ahead and do this. 
we are upfront with the government saying that you know these are the various elements we need to put in place and this is where we need your support so instead of just being the front end and trying to drive it the perspective is the government owns this engagement and and you know the government plays a very very integral part of creating that synergy between the various forces and ensuring that you know it's a common message that goes across to the end audience i'm going to skip through this the the third element was in terms of access so relevance and affordability without access does not really succeed and access uh, in in our definition is the uh, is is also in terms of ensuring that the target audience has access to the pcs they have access to funds they have access to content uh, you know and all elements of access that uh, that needs to uh, you know really reach that the, the last mile so to speak and uh, that's something we constantly keep a look out for as we build the uh, value proposition with the government and uh, in terms of ensuring that we have some uh, good public private engagement so a uh, quick summary the way we look at it relevance uh, you know i mentioned about relevance relevance to the government relevance to the target audience that we're looking at and relevance to the private partners it's it's important to have this upfront without which we have seen cases which doesn't necessarily succeed or uh, achieve the uh, end goals that uh, we set out to uh, achieve affordability is critical uh, our definition of affordability differs very very uh, you know uh, at at various levels when it comes to the target audience that we are talking about uh, access to various elements of the uh, you know relevance and affordability is critical uh, a consortium having the right partners the right mindset and uh, you know working with the government is an absolute must and uh, last, last but not the ne uh, least it's a win win for all parties concerned sustainability is critical so we need to ensure that every party who's engaged in a public private partnership does see some kind of a return in in the longer run so so th those are some of the learnings that we have and uh, you know i mean uh, like i said uh, i i uh, met most of the panelists only uh, you know just before the presentation and uh, you know personally i'm 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 very happy to uh, see that you know some of the elements that we are addressing are all points that have been brought out by the rest of the panelists and uh, you know i'm here in case you have any questions happy to answer it now or later thank you are there any questions of comprehension uh, so we heard uh, an example on how microsoft is is uh, working together with governments in order to uh, uh, create uh, public value or to create access to public value and we also had some examples on what they think are uh, examples of public value like uh, enhancing the inclusion of, of seniors public health and, and so on now for the last speaker I would like to give the floor to to uh, Jack Dish Lada from uh, Tata consultancy services thank you thank you very much <coughs> I would like to uh, talk about. I would like to talk about how Tata has helped various governments to bring the internet to our citizens. Okay, as everybody has given the perspective that we need to have uh, various uh, mechanisms to deliver messages. Maybe this is louder. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about how. Tata has helped, TCS has helped various governments across the globe to bring public values to citizens uh, by various means. I would like to take a couple of examples wherein uh, TCS has helped a uh, government to transform the public uh, services. One of the uh, classic example is that Andhra Pradesh. We are all, everybody hosted in Andhra Pradesh. It's one of the state, uh, state portal, which is a joint venture between the government and TCS, which talks about uh, a special gateway to it basically provides the official gateway to citizens. In this portal, uh, it provides uh, various kind of information. It provides the information about government transactions, entities, what they do. Also, it basically provides a transactional services to public. Uh, citizens through this portal this uh, the portal has a uniqueness it also basically provides uh, employment to uh, people by hosting the kiosks across the states 
So there are about 200 kiosks or e-seva centers which are run by unemployment, uh, un unemployed people to provide services to citizens. So to access this portal, we don't need to have uh, internet available at each, every, each, each citizen's house. They can go to a particular center, register themselves, and get access to services. And this portal, it's the official gateway and basically provides a e-governance moment in the TCS. It's one of the unique portal which provides various services on informative, interactive, and transactional. Informative means it basically provides the information about the governments, what is happening, uh, about a uh, lot of activities about the uh, state. Uh, state Interactive, it basically provides a lot of uh, current information. And also it basically provides transactionals. The citizens can go pay utility bills. They can uh, pay the transactions, in, uh, taxes to the government. And this portal has uh, delivered to a multiple channels. Like it has an online portal, as I mentioned. Also, it has a kiosk, which is run by the unemployment, uh, unemployed people across the state. Also, it, it can be accessed through handled devices. OK, so just to summarize how this portal is used by various people, uh, there are approximately 2.5 million people in Andhra Pradesh states access this portal. And there are about like uh, 50,000 to 60,000 hits per day on this portal to access various services. And there are about 1,300 e-seva centers are there which basically uses this portal. One of the initiatives this uh, portal has done is they have tied with uh, life insurance uh, LIC in India. Okay? And this portal provides a premium collections through this, uh, for this LIC. They have done the highest collections uh, for LIC through this portal. Another thing I want to talk about basically is that what, how the TCS has helped uh, to this basically is they have built a NRIGA portal. It's basically a portal for rural development. It basically provides uh, information uh, for wages collections for people who are unemployed. And it basically tracks and records the citizens uh, to this portal. Another example I would like to talk about here is about the MCA 21. It's basically a portal for uh, Ministry of Company Affairs. See, if you look at it in terms of uh, typically in the government and governance, uh, registration of a company is a tedious job. It takes a uh, lot of time to register the portal, uh, register the company. So this portal basically provides a mechanism of registering the companies and tracking their activities throughout the life of the company. And it is basically established on a public-private partnership model. These are the critical examples where uh, we have worked hand in hand with the government, provide various services and enable government to provide services via internet to a common people. These services are provided through uh, internet as an online portal, also through provided to a kiosk. Those are the critical examples I would like to talk about this. Thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Jack Dees. Um, I would like now like to open up the floor for discussion. Um, if you if you have a look at what the Council of Europe uh, is, is 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 regarding as public value of the internet is the quality or the potential of the internet to improve life in all aspects, econo economical mm -hmm. development, uh, uh, political development, social development, and I, I think we have heard a few examples of what these elements of the public value are on how the different actors are contributing to create them and to make them accessible. Now we would like to hear from you, ask questions or tell us what you think are elements of public value. Uh, maybe we try first to, to, to uh, concentrate on, on what is public value and then on the second part of, of how this value should be best created and is best accessible. Um, or whatever. Okay, uh, the man in, in the back. Yes. And please introduce yourself when you take the floor. Thank 
Andrew Puddy Fatsheim from a company called Global Partners based in the UK. I think the, um, the key value for me, which I'm not sure we've touched on yet, that the internet and digital network communications brings is interactivity. Lots of governments are developing e-government and services, but they're very much in a, what I'd see as a web one mold. You broadcast, you set out your information, you establish ways of transferring and dealing with interactions with people one-to-one, -one, that's fine. I do my taxes, my VAT, or my banking online, that's terrific. But the really interesting thing about the communication capacity now is the way you can interact. And I think that's a challenge to the very structure of public and private organizations because they, they're not used to interacting. They are hierarchical organizations with a certain way of doing policy. And they find it very difficult to cope with a, a, a growing mass of people who want to interact and shape and intervene and direct policy rather than simply be the recipients of things that are coming out there. And so for me, the public value of the internet and the, and the modern network communications is interactivity. And that's a challenge. It's not just a technical question. It's a political challenge to how organizations restructure themselves to enable to act, actually interact with the public in a more direct way. Thank you very much. I think that's a very uh, relevant and, and interesting point that has not been raised so far. Other comments? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. My name is uh, Francois Pellegrini. I'm a member of uh, an NGO uh, uh, promoting uh, open source and uh, free software. But the, the, the point I want to, to address here is that we have been talking about uh, technical uh, fostering of universal access, but there are also legal impediments to universal access. And for instance, uh, in Europe, uh, we have recently seen uh, through the discussions of the telecom package, which contains the universal service directive, uh, the problem of content-oriented amendments which were uh, tentatively introduced by uh, uh, some, uh, some um, private uh, entities and which aimed at reducing the connectivity of users uh, through the, what they call the three strikes approach. That is, if you, do, uh, the, if you are suspected of, of three illegal downloads, then your <coughs> access is cut off, which means no access to e-knowledge, to e-administration, which is completely contrary to the principles that are set up by the European Commission itself. And so we see here a conflict because some private interests which have a, a, a model of, of rent monopoly and, and well, well, based their, their, their business model on rarity are now fighting just to, to, to have this model persist while we are in the revolution of access. And so uh, there is a problem uh, about what we want globally for the, for the society at large and define new models of remunerating authors, et cetera, et cetera, in order to guarantee the freedom of expressions of the citizens over the internet and to have the proportionality. Cutting the internet access as a consequence of illegal downloading, is it proportionate with regards of the, the main objectives of the, the internet uh, access to everyone? Thank you very much for this contribution. Uh, being Swiss, uh, we are not yet a member of the European Union, but we are aware of, of these discussions. And of course, it's questionable if, if, uh, that, if that you can cut somebody's access to the internet because he's doing some, something that is maybe illegal, but it's not a, it's not a, a murder, it, it's a kind of, it's, it's the same question, like if you, if you would steal a, a bike to go to the train station and you are caught, you're not allowed to use a train anymore for a certain amount of time. So it, it's a question, but uh, the Euro, the Euro, I know that the, in the Union there is uh, lots of discussion on this and, and also in Germany and in other countries. And of course people who are, who are fighting for their property rights, they like the system because that might help them to enforce the system. Yeah, but as you said, and just as a, a last comment, in fact, it poses some problems of proportionality, but also of, of the burden of proof, <coughs> because you don't know who in a whole family is guilty of <coughs> illegal downloading. And all the more there is a, a, a internet sharing access, public access can, uh, can may, must a public access point be closed because some people could do illegal downloading through them. There is the problem of filtering. There is the problem of monitoring the, PC, <coughs> the, the personal computers of the home uh, of the people at home, which means putting a camera in e e everybody's places. I mean, while the idea seems simplistic and can be, uh, uh, well, say, admitted by m most lawmakers, 
who do not think enough about it, the, the consequences are, are, are you mentioned are tremendous in terms of civil liberties <coughs> and the, the basic law principles. Yeah, and one, one last thing. This shows that uh, whereas television and radio are regarded as kind of you have a right, even if you have no money, if you, if you can pay your bills, the police will not come and take away your television because this is regarded as right to information. But the internet, people are not there yet to regard the internet as part of the global public good. I would like to give the floor to Freddie. Yes, for I would just uh, <coughs> make a remark, I'd like to say, it's very interesting. Uh, it depends uh, the country you are coming uh, on because uh, uh, I know in some country in Europe, thank you, I know that in some country in Europe, uh, some government want to, to make, uh, to take measure, I will say, uh, uh, ex ante. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's the case, uh, we heard something about uh, a law in France. But uh, in Sudan, we prefer to regulate uh, ex post, that means uh, it was a question of the, of the court, if there is a complaint and to take measures. But it's not uh, uh, suspicious through uh, uh, administration uh, to say, well, uh, perhaps there is a problem there and we will cut off uh, the, the, the possibility to access to internet. I think uh, I, I understand your, your point of view. It's a question if you, a state, want to have ex post or ex ante uh, legislation, if I can say so. But the amendment prevented uh, administrations from cutting the internet mm -hmm. access without a prior legal judgment. Mm -hmm. It was removed by the Council of Ministers of the European Union mm -hmm. less than a week ago. Mm -hmm which means that these concerns are addressed in some sort yeah. of yeah. This is a very important issue, but I would still like yeah. to, but you're, it's good that this discussion is, 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 is held in Europe, but, and it's also important for other countries maybe. Uh, yes? Well, uh, my name is Rolf Weber. I'm a law professor at the University of <coughs> Zurich. I mean, since we are addressing legal topic, I just would like to say one word uh, to your question. And probably I should say I'm more on your side than on the other side, but nevertheless, it's not only a question of proportionality, it's of course also a question of balancing interests. If you are from the police side, for example, if you want to be protected against terrorism, you would like to have <coughs> more surveillance. And here you have just to find some kind of an equal balancing uh, test. And somehow, unfortunately, these days, the train goes into the direction of more surveillance and not of less surveillance. But I wanted to uh, address uh, the presentation of uh, yes, yes. Harsha, and in particular, <coughs> your uh, comments on, on our portability. And unfortunately, you just skipped a slide, which I thought would be highly uh, interesting uh, on affordability. Affordability, on the one hand, means that the services uh, can be offered uh, to the civil society at, a, at affordable prices. But I think also, and this I would uh, really appreciate if you could a little bit uh, more go into the details. It also means that a country needs to have the financial means to do all these uh, projects. So to a certain extent, affordability is also given at the side uh, of the offering. Uh, you have chosen an example of uh, Guatemala. But uh, how do you deal with the financing if a country just does not have the financial means to start all these uh, projects? Uh, how can public-private uh, partnership then survive? Who's going to finance, basically financing the whole project? So if you could elaborate a little bit uh, on that, uh, I would be highly interested. Okay, so, so for us, affordability has uh, different connotations. And uh, like I said, uh, there are instances where uh, we, we talk about uh, complete end-to-end uh, you know, -end government involvement in terms of building the, uh, providing the funding. Now, that's an, that's an ideal case scenario. In most cases, in fact, 90% of the cases, the government doesn't fund the entire PC purchase, uh, like, like what happened in Guatemala. So what the government does, and that's where we do the balancing act, uh, is uh, you know, the government might provide a subsidy. Could be like 10%, 20% subsidy. The balance, balance 80% then gets funded by a, a private bank or a government-funded bank in some manner. And the affordability element comes instead of you know the uh, the, the customer paying uh, the balance 80% in one shot, 
may be spread over three years. So if in, in Guatemala's case, uh, let, me, let me not use Guatemala, uh, let me use an example of uh, you know, what we're doing in India, for example, where we're we discussing about uh, uh, you know, a state where the, go the government will subsidize 30% of the cost of the PC. The balance 70% gets funded out of the salary from the employee, but spread over three years. Right, and uh, the normal uh, the normal banking financing is usually around one year or uh, at most two years. So we, we give that flexibility, and this is where the government comes in and supports, works with the bank, and uh, ensures that you know the the, the monthly installment gets cut out of the uh, salary through the bank, uh, you know where the where the employee gets the salary from. So the the affordability element <coughs> also means, and and this is based on the learning where. The government doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily agree to a situation where a hundred percent subsidy means that the employees, uh, you know, end up using the PC. So when when there is an investment from the uh, employee side, they tend to use it a bit more. So you know, we also consciously don't necessarily go to the government and always ask for a hundred percent subsidy. So we try to balance it in some in, in some manner. So it's uh, you know, the government is also happy that there is a local partner who supports the uh, financing model in some way. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hi, Queen wants to react yeah, if, uh, if to may, quickly to the, the guy over there, and then we continue. Yeah, uh, if I may, uh, just to uh, uh, respond to uh, the first question, uh, actually a comment uh, made by the gentleman there. I thought this is a very important issue, and, and I just want to uh, 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 mention to you that uh, the survey that uh, the U you and DESA has been doing uh, in fact uh, uh, contains a major, uh, one of the major components on the interactivity, so we call it e-participation. Uh, so we not only check the, uh, the, the other part, which is e-readiness, which is consists of uh, the IT infrastructure and human capital, and, and also the, uh, the measurement of the websites of the government services, but uh, the, the e-participation, we also check uh, uh, three things. The first is uh, what are the information that you provide which promote uh, the citizens' engagement. And second is that there's any consultations which takes place uh, between the citizen and the government. And then the third is that whether this consultation is, uh, or some of the, the important feedbacks has been reflected in the final decision making of the policies of the government. So I thought that is something which uh, we, I, I didn't mention, but I think it's addressing the issue that you, uh, uh, you uh, raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, sorry. <laughs> First you and then you. OK. My name is Kesunare. Uh, <coughs> I'm representing Ambedkar Center for Justice and Peace, sorry, human right organization, sorry. global Thank human right organization, and national president. So my, uh, there are two questions. One is affordability and another is accessibility. So in India, there are about 81% population is living in the villages in the rural India, where the internet is not accessible. It is, uh, and um, about 20% population, uh, it is available, accessible in the cities, metro cities like Delhi, Bombay, or Hyderabad, or Bangalore. But the population is so poor, they are earning they did not earn much and they, they are not able to afford it. So now here is, is the role of the government. They should step in and they should make it sure that the internet is accessible to the vast population, majority population, that population of about 850 million people in India. They have no access to the internet. And it is surprising, most of the uh, government, public sector corporations, government departments, and uh, multinational corporations, they are publishing their advertisements for recruitment and other things. That is on the internet. And in the villages, there is, they, they do not have any access. So how, uh, how, do, how they will progress, how they will get connected. So here is the role of the, the government, the uh, state government or the central government, they should join <coughs> together. And they should uh, make it sure that internet is accessible, whether it is a poor or rich. You see, uh, in India, 44% population, as per UNDP report, 44% population is below poverty line. The earning is less than a dollar. So it is not possible for this 44% people to uh, go and spend 20 rupees or 15 rupees an hour on the internet. It is very costly. Because a person earns 40 rupees or 50 rupees a day. He cannot spend 20 rupees or 15 rupees uh, uh, surfing on the internet for one hour. So now it is the role of the government and the global uh, society, civil society, to see that in India, 
the most population should uh, have the access to the internet. And uh, I would like to uh, have some comments from the, the, the chair. Yeah. Uh, I understand your concern about uh, not having accessibility to common people in India. Yeah. Uh, I would like to give a couple of examples uh, which we have is utilized in Andhra Pradesh and other, other places to get access to by common people. Okay, there's a portal called apionline.gov.in. It is a joint venture uh, for, by the government. It is an official gateway of accessing the information. What this portal has done basically is that it has created a kiosk at more than 200 different locations across the state. Okay, so the portal is not only accessed by major cities, the kiosks are established at the uh, village level, district level, taluka level, wherein they can go and access the surveys through kiosks. Okay, it serves a two purpose. One basically it creates the employment people who are running this kiosk and also have a <coughs> accessibility by common people. Okay, and these services are, are free of cost to a common people. So common people can go to a particular kiosk or a particular e-seva center, they call it the e-seva center in the Andhra Pradesh. They can go, register themselves, and avail the services which can be provided by this portal, like informative, interactive, and transactional, which can be afforded by common people. Okay, similar thing we'll be doing for the passport, the passport project, which will be we are launching soon uh, across the India, e-passport wherein this passport server will be available at the doorsteps of the citizens. Citizens can go in, walk into a multiple locations across the India and access the services uh, via these services, via this thing basically. Okay? Are you talking only of the Andhra Pradesh government or the whole of India? Whole of India. It's basically going to expand, the it's going to expand to the whole of the India basically through the e-passport server. So j just to add to that, uh, just to add to the comment uh, from Jagdish, uh, the, the government of India is also looking at the uh, citizen service centers, the CSEs, kiosks that's being uh, spread across the uh, country. So that will give uh, one element of access. The second element of affordability is not just traditional afford uh, you know, access to uh, computers, but uh, bringing the cost of uh, you know, the ownership down. Now, if you notice, India, you have a huge amount of uh, you know, mobile phones that are going into uh, the, the, the normal masses, and especially the poorer uh, sections of society. Uh, so there are various pilots that are happening across the country today where the mobile phone is used as an access to uh, you know, the government services. Uh, and, and that's something that is going, that's beginning to change the way people are accessing technology and you know, um, uh, addressing some of the requirements that they have. So that, that's just to answer your question on not just traditional modes, but then uh, you know, non-traditional modes as well. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to the man uh, who has, wait, has, has to wait for quite a long time. Yeah, uh, my question is to the government officials here. Um, the one point that was made was that government shouldn't uh, bring barriers to access. And I think after the public-private partnerships uh, presentation, uh, we know recently we've seen companies been found guilty of um, anti-competitive behavior, uh, of um, uh, monopoly, um, of m being a monopoly or taking advantage of their monopolies. So my question to the government people here is, what are they doing to make sure that the partnerships that they create don't uh, create barriers so that people can access government websites and government documents with, uh, with affordability and uh, all the other issues in terms of access. Thanks. So your question is, uh, uh, if, if a government go, uh, enters, enters in a private-public partnership with a, with a company, yeah. how to make sure that this company does not get an advantage over the other ones? Is that the question? Or, well, or? I'm saying in the context where we've seen huge fines <coughs> being le Sorry. In the context where we've seen huge fines being leveled against companies for uh, taking advantage of their monopolies, and of being anti-competitive. How does government engage to make sure that citizens can still access government information without added barriers? 
Thank you. Yes, uh, for instance, in, in Europe, you might probably know that the European Commission and Microsoft are in a more or less constant battle about the monopoly position uh, in Microsoft. But nevertheless, for instance, also my Swiss government, we are using uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, software in, in our daily work. And Microsoft is, is also in Switzerland, for instance, very active with empowering children. And, 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 and they're doing many uh, uh, things. And, and in other countries, uh, they are uh, having private-public uh, private partnerships. Um, I uh, personally do not deal with, with uh, these uh, private-public partnerships. I don't know whether, Frederick, you have, uh, you know something. Otherwise, we would ask whether some other uh, government people or people with experience are in the room. Yes, if you have a comment. Uh, this is a comment specifically to the point which has just uh, been made. Um, I'm from the UK, Chris Corbyn, but I'm involved in the European Union um, directive and implementation of the reuse of public sector information. And that particular directive outlaws uh, PPPs or um, exclusive arrangements which stop downstream activity uh, for, from use. So the, what it does is it's basically saying to the public services that enter into PPPs, you must ensure that in fact it's one that the IPR or the release of the information still sits with that public sector body, not with the body who they've done the PPP to, to ensure the downstream activity of everybody else in society. So the European Union in fact has um, set that um, policy now for three or four years in the European Union and the OECD, who's also here in the IGF, will be presenting tomorrow exactly the same policy for all OECD members, which was improved in Seoul in uh, Korea in June. So just, just to uh, add to that, uh, you know, most of the governments that we work with are also very particular about ensuring that the, uh, you know, the, the, the data or any other uh, content that is developed is owned by them. So in most cases, when we actually work with the uh, governments, uh, and I'm just taking this as a Microsoft example, uh, in most of these cases, we do end up in a scenario where we compete with you know, local partners as well in terms of getting the business once, once it's done. Just a comment to the comment. Uh, owning the data is good, but you have to take care of the data format and the openness of the data format. Because if you own your data in the data format yet that you cannot access without being linked, to a particular vendor, then you don't really own your data. So this is a, an important point. And dealing with op open uh, formats, open standards, and eventually uh, uh, free software is also a solution. Thank you. This is an important point. And for instance, my country, uh, our administration has realized that this can be a problem. And we have now a strategy on how to, to deal with preservation of, of documents and accessibility. And this also includes uh, open source and, and, and things like that. Uh, Yes, you, and then I would like to give the floor to Frederick Reil, and then to you. Uh, I'm Guru from IT for Change. I thought the uh, gentleman before me made this point about uh, access is not sufficient because even if you make sure that there's provision all over the world, people are not going to have money to go and access the service. Even something like 10 rupees an hour, which is nothing, is an impossible barrier for 40% of India and maybe 60% of humanity. I wanted to draw a parallel between internet beyond access and education beyond access because the, th the theme Internet for All is actually derived from Education for All theme that the UN conference that Jomtin in 1990 adopted. And if you look at India, for example, education is something everybody has a right to. <coughs> and uh, what does that mean? It means that there is a huge public provision for public education. And access is the first part of it. Access means government has to make sure there are schools everywhere. But putting schools everywhere doesn't mean children will come, they will not come. Even if the, there are no fees, children will not come simply because the parents can't afford textbooks, can't afford to send them to school. So the first principle is access, but that's the first and the, I think the most trivial one, which is to put infrastructure <coughs> everywhere. After access, there is a concept called retention, and sorry, there's a concept called enrollment, which is that children should actually come to school. And for enrollment, it's not sufficient to have a school. You need to provide free uniforms, you need to provide free textbooks, you need to provide transport facilities to the school. And these are actually happening in India through a program called Saradik Shabhyan. After enrollment is retention. Children come, children drop out because the environment in the school is not conducive. If you look at the internet, it means that if you provide internet centers everywhere, it can be, I think, what Dadan Jukliman said, you can't do it in a private pu public partnership model in a way that somebody who goes to that center to look for free government services 
is given the cold shoulder because the private sector entrepreneur sitting in that franchisee center doesn't think it's a great thing for that uh, entrepreneur to do. And this can be a severe problem in the government CSC scheme that uh, you might have this person spoke about. So enrollment and then retention. People have to come, people have to use it. And finally, the goal in the education system is quality of learning. And it would translate into the internet uh, as quality of use. Are you merely, merely you know, downloading data? Are you having ability to create data on the internet? What's your basic power on the net? So when you're saying beyond access, we have to look at the parallels of enrollment, retention, and participation. So I think unless all these three things are done, access of no use. And one of the biggest problems that we face is the idea that markets or PPP can make sure that we will actually go beyond access. And that, I think, is a very big problem. So just like we accept that education is a right and that public investment, public provisioning is a must, I think the same thing has to go for beyond universal access. What do we do for internet? You have to do much more, <coughs> just depending on the market. And I think Government of India scheme, which is Sarodiksha Abhyan, is a very pioneering, very powerful scheme. And I think we should have similar concepts as far as the internet access is also concerned. Thank you very much. Um, actually, um, uh, Karol Jakubowicz, who was an expert and was also, also financed by the Council of Europe, who could not come, he's also the chair of the Information for All program uh, of UNESCO, the IFAP. And he uh, had, would have made some uh, interesting contributions also with regard to, to national implementation strategy in order to build these uh, requisites for access to this universal service. And I have a few copies here of, of one of his papers. and. Uh, he, he, in another paper that he also wanted to present, he um, made a study on, on how in the US the internet services and contents are financed. And he found out that quite a large proportion also in the US is not so-called market driven but actually publicly financed. And so his quite provocative uh, 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 position in that paper is that basically internet does not work on a market basis because it's, it's a network with scale uh, effects and so on. that. It needs, also in, in, in developed countries, it needs much public finance to, to create services, to, to provide access, and so on and so forth. And of course, this is a problem for, for uh, developing countries. Uh, Freddy Green? Well, just a remark that concerns um, what's concerned monopolies. Uh, a way to respond to this question is uh, uh, when the government have uh, the idea to make uh, private public-private partnership, is that the government or administration uh, make a, a, an appeal to offer a sort of a beauty contest system. And uh, uh, of course, sometimes we have some problem. If I take the example in Switzerland with the universal service, uh, the only was, was response was uh, Swisscom. That means the, the, the former incumbent, that means uh, the operator with the dominant position. And in this case, it is to the competition uh, commission in each country to care of that uh, uh, there will be not too much advantage uh, taken by the, the, the monopolies or the dominant position uh, operator or, or enterprise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who want, you wanted to take this one. Yes, I, I just wanted to make, I suppose, three very brief points. Um, first, perhaps an ob observation. Um, when we talk about um, the public values of the, in of the internet, Perhaps it's a little bit obvious, but one of those values is, is its publicness. And, and there's certainly a risk. Well, there's not so much a risk, perhaps there's a cost. When you public public private partnerships, to a certain extent, you have to balance against the cost to publicness. <coughs> and I want to make the point that, secondly, that that cost is quite different. In, in many developing country contexts, and I'm coming from South Africa, um, that we talked about, I think we heard 75% of families don't have access to the internet. If we've also heard that in order to be able to address that 75%, we require some kind of private, public-private partnership, then the role of, of the private sector in terms of addressing that 75% access gap is very, very different in a country like India or South Africa or whatever to what it is in Europe. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned. I mean, I, I heard the, the gentleman from Microsoft talking about Guatemala. I mean, they are very carefully talk about digitally empowered teachers or people who are learning to use their PCs. They actually neglect to mention that what they're actually learning, I'm assuming, 
is um, learning to use products of a particular value. In most cases, they will be learning to use Microsoft Windows, learning to use Microsoft Office, learning to use, etc. Now, I think we must actually recognize this as a cost to publicness, and I think we have to recognize that it's a cost which is disproportionately um, felt in developing countries. Thank you, Maharaj. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Uh, well, uh, see, the discussions that we have with the governments, I think the governments also make a call somewhere down the line. And uh, in, in many cases, it's, it's a pro and con discussion. And I, I, I suspect in Guatemala, I, I didn't manage the account directly, but I do have those kind of discussions with various governments here. And uh, there are governments which are, you know, which, which give an equal option to the other uh, parties as well and make a, you know, ask them to come back with proposals. And there are uh, governments which you know, uh, just didn't, don't go forward with the discussion. So there are both kinds. So to answer your question, in, in situations where we get into that discussion and uh, where we do our investments to build that entire ecosystem uh, you know, ground up, there, there, is, there is an element. I mean, from a, a, from a perspective, and that's where I spoke about the sustainability model, uh, there is economics involved. So you know, there, there, that's something that we do uh, upfront, talk to the government, and they make a decision based on that. So, yeah, I mean, in, in uh, Guatemala's case, yes, there was uh, a Windows, which is what we did. we trained the teachers on, but we did not restrict, or you know, we did not uh, tell the government that that's the only platform to work on. So all the uh, training, it's not just on Windows. They have content, which is various subjects, which resides on the net. The teachers have the ability to go and buy any PC and access the net directly, and uh, you know, uh, go through the training themselves. So that that's where I said, you know, we don't necessarily control the entire end-to-end -end element. We, we, we have our uh, deliverables built in, but then the openness is there. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes. Yeah. yeah, just Microsoft entering uh, you know, into agreements with governments that we establish a training center for you, and in that training center, only Microsoft technologies need to be taught. I've been to a Microsoft operated training center where we tried to install open office to train the teachers on open office and we were barred from installing open office so i think you know like the gentleman said it's a question that when you introduce microsoft or any proprietary technologies into the education system you're building an ecosystem for the future right once somebody uses like any proprietary technologies for 10 years then after that they may not really switch over to another technology so i just wanted to respond to that comment and uh, another point to make when you initially spoke about what is publicness as far as the internet is concerned and what do we need to consider to make it more public, I think one point to consider is that all the standards which are needed to operate on the internet, which, are, which you need to work on the internet, need to be public. You, need, you can't have proprietary standards, either for data encoding or for file formats. You can't have private or proprietary formats. And uh, when we speak about the governments and governments offering services on the internet and governments offering information on the internet, we actually have examples of government sites in India where it says that to view this site, it's I mean you know it's best viewed in Internet Explorer 6.0. We can't have the <coughs> government offering some data in a proprietary format, right? I might be able to buy maybe a PC, but I might not be able to afford to buy Microsoft or you know, Microsoft Office. I might just be able to use Linux or any other open source system and Firefox. So the government needs to take care that any services that it offers is accessible on an operating system which is free and open and accessible on a browser which is free and open. 